do we have to? It looks like the attendees are still on. I still see the same number. Do we have to change our audio pin? Your audio pin will come up in the box under audio. And you right. just push pound, the pin, and then pound. OK, I'll do that. OK, I think we'll go ahead and continue then. Um, I apologize to everybody for the technical difficulties. But um, I guess we can just turn it over to Margo to go ahead and start. That sounds great. And, um, <laughs> and I think my slides will be coming up any second. Here they come now. So there's a lot happening these days around improving school food and wellness, including for school meals, vending, a la carte, and fundraisers. Um, school districts have adopted nutrition and physical activity wellness policies. Many states and districts have implemented policies to remove sugary drinks and unhealthy snacks from schools from a variety of venues. Um, USDA has updated the nutrition standards and meal patterns for school lunches and breakfasts, which will begin to go into effect this fall. And Congress passed a provision in the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act that requires USDA to update the national nutrition standards for food sold outside the meal program, basically to get candy, soda, and other unhealthy foods out of vending machines school stores, a la carte, fundraisers, and any venues anywhere on campus during the school day. So the new law requires that the updated nutrition standards apply to school fundraisers, just to the ones that take place on the school campus during the school day. So it wouldn't cover fundraisers that happen outside the school day, like the take-home kind of fundraisers. Um, USDA is allowed to provide limited exemptions for school-approved fundraisers if they're infrequent and if they're approved by the school. So USDA doesn't have to provide any exemptions for fundraisers. They just have the ability to do that if they want to. The fundraising provision has been a little more controversial than the rest of the requirements through the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act for foods outside of meals. I think mostly because there's been so much focus on meals and vending that people are used to that. That's become popular and it's become acceptable. So because fundraisers are newer to some parents and policymakers, it seems a little more controversial. Also, some policymakers still don't understand why addressing fundraisers is important. One of the reasons why it's important to address them is because there are a lot of fundraisers in schools. It's not just a monthly bake sale. And I think a lot of people think about fundraisers and they think of it as happening very infrequently. But fundraisers happen very regularly in many schools. There's pizza sold outside the cafeteria at lunchtime. Donuts sold as kids are coming into school. Candy sold at the end of the school day. And lots of other foods sold in schools. Now, it's not that I'm a big fan of bake sales, but you do often hear you know, whether or not bake sales should be allowed. And people seem to have this um, nostalgia and affinity for bake sales. Um, sweet bake goods are a top source of calories, sugars, and unhealthy fats in kids' diets. Also, as a parent, um, this fundraiser doesn't particularly make sense to me. We parents go out and buy ingredients, we bake them, and then we send our kids to school with money to buy those baked goods back. So we're hearing a lot about bake sales and how you know we have to make sure that bake sales are allowed politically. That seems to resonate with some folks on the Hill. But um, I think from both the nutrition standpoint and the practical standpoint that oftentimes these are not um, the best fundraisers. Um, Hannah, it looks like you have control of the slides. I'll take the next slide. Um, another common fundraiser in schools are label redemption programs, like General Mills Box Tops for Education and Campbell's Labels for Education. 
these programs are positioned as corporate donations, as philanthropy to schools, but really they are marketing programs. One reason we're concerned about them is that 80% of the foods that are eligible under both the General Mills and Campbell's programs are of poor nutritional value. Also, allowing these companies to market unhealthy foods to kids isn't really worth the modest benefit that most schools get. For example, with Campbell's Labels for Education program, families would have to buy about $1,400 worth of soup to get just one box of colored pencils. Um, if we can go to the next slide, another overall concern about school fundraisers is that enlisting children to sell unhealthy foods to their friends and families sends them the message that nutrition isn't important. And it undermines the already too little nutrition education that schools are giving. So, you know, we'll try to teach our kids about the importance of nutrition in the classroom and then turn around and say to kids, oh, well, when it comes to money, when it comes to um, you know, everyday life, nutrition doesn't matter. Go ahead and sell pizza kits and donuts and candy bars. Branded fundraisers like selling Hershey candy bars or Christopher King donuts are a key way that companies market unhealthy eating to kids. There is much about marketing the products and cultivating brand loyalty in kids for a lifetime as they are about selling products now. The next slide, um, please. Um, so studies show that food marketing causes kids to want more and eat more of the foods that are marketed to them. Food marketing works. Companies wouldn't be doing it if it didn't. The reason it's a concern is that the vast majority of foods that are marketed to kids overall, and particularly in schools, are unhealthy. If companies were marketing healthy products like broccoli and bananas, there wouldn't be a problem. But the top marketed food in schools are sugary drinks. By far, that's the most common category marketed to kids. There are also snack foods, fast foods, and other foods of poor nutritional value. Next slide. Clubs, parents, athletic departments, school administrators, and others might be reluctant to stop using fundraisers that have worked for them in the past. But we need to help them, as well as federal, state, and local policymakers, understand that there are lots of healthy fundraising alternatives. Many healthy fundraisers are not only practical, but also just as profitable or more profitable than unhealthy fundraisers. Experience shows that schools can make just as much money with healthy fundraisers as with unhealthy ones. The FBI has fact sheets and a report, which you see here, Sweet Deal, which describes dozens of profitable and practical fundraisers and includes the contact information for over 60 companies that provide healthy school fundraising programs. I have some examples on the next slide. Healthy fundraising alternatives include bottled water sales, where schools can get local businesses to sponsor this fundraiser. The business gets their logo on the back, and on the front of the water bottle, there'll be a school logo or message to, um, that the school can put on there. So they can put their mascot, or they can put a special message. Um, Hannah, can you go to the next slide? So we have these lists. Um, calendars, reading cards, holiday decorations, Toys, book fairs have been used successfully by schools. Selling all different kinds of products, candles, fruit baskets, spices, plants, flower bulbs, clothing, jewelry, personal care products, that oftentimes what schools need to do is just try out a few different kinds of fundraisers and find the ones that work for them. So maybe you find that selling bulbs, you know, when it's time for planting flower bulbs, isn't the best thing in your community. Maybe not many people are gardening, but maybe selling personal care products or first aid kits work. Book fairs can be very popular. Wrapping paper works in some schools, but maybe selling Christmas trees and holiday cards will work better in others. So there are lots of options. And if we go to the next slide, um, we can see you know just some of the possibilities for money raised from different fundraisers. One fundraiser that schools have found to be particularly profitable are physical activity fundraisers, things like fun runs, bolathons, sporting events. These, you know, having one big event like this can replace dozens of smaller fundraisers 
And on top of that, as a bonus, you can support and promote physical activity. A number of grocery stores have programs that give a percentage of the community member's purchases to designated local schools, where all you have to do is put in your code, and every time you use your bonus card or you know your loyalty card at the supermarket, your school will get a cut of your purchase. School, um, schools also have partnerships or use gift cards from grocery stores, coffee shops, bookstores, and other retail stores where the schools will buy the gift cards at a discount and then sell the gift cards to parents for the full price, and then the school keeps the difference. Um, on the next slide is the website for the NANA. The National Alliance for Nutrition and Activity has developed a model school wellness policy, which includes a strong provision around school fundraisers. So one of the key ways that fundraisers can be addressed is through your school wellness policy. This policy was developed by 50 other members of the National Alliance for Nutrition and Activity. It has not only a model policy, but lots of background materials to help schools implement that policy. And we're going to hear more from Dr. Shariki about the policies that states and localities have around fundraising. Most often, those policies just apply the nutrition standards for vending and a la carte to fundraisers. Those policies are implemented at the state level through legislation, through regulation, and state boards of education policy. Um, if we go to the next slide, <coughs> just a little bit about how you can get involved. USDA is in the process of writing updated standards for all the foods that are sold outside the meal program, including fundraisers. Those standards are expected to come out very soon. My last um, discussion with the White House and USDA said it could be in the next couple of weeks that things are going well and moving forward, and hopefully those will be out soon. The National Alliance for Nutrition and Activity is developing a model comment, bringing together experts to, think, to look through USDA's proposed standards very carefully and come up with recommendations of what we support, what we don't support, and we'll be providing that model comment to any organizations that are interested in using it. We'll also develop a model action alert that you could share with your members. We're going to need to get lots of comments into USDA to counter any industry pressure that they get to weaken the standards and to make sure that they can finalize strong standards. We'll also need your help to educate your members of Congress to prevent Congress from weakening the standards like they did with the new school meal standards, where they prevented USDA from limiting french fries and declared pizza as a vegetable. Just an, another thing in terms of timeline, after the comment period, USDA will study all the comments and issue final regulations. There will be a phase-in period for the new standards to give schools time to comply. So the final standards will probably not be in full effect for another two, maybe three years. Schools will need your continued help to move toward healthier fundraising options now and then also when the new national standards go into effect. So I'll just end with the next slide and point you to our website for additional background materials and policies at cspi.net.org slash nutrition policy. And there's a section on school foods and a number of things around healthy school fundraising. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Shariki, who will talk about what policies are currently in place regarding school fundraising. Great. Thank you, Margo. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much, and that was a very nice segue. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today, and as Margo indicated, I'm going to give you a rather quick overview of kind of the extent to which states and districts have already started addressing fundraising through their um, state laws and school district uh, wellness and other policies. Um, part of the reason why this is a, you know real important is that um, you know, since we don't have federal restrictions and there's a real push to try and move in this direction, um, I want to identify where we have some real policy opportunities at all levels of government, not just at the federal level. Um, next slide, please. So today I just want to quickly walk you through, tell you a little bit about our program um, so you know who we are and, and what type of research we do, and then um, give you an overview of the state and district laws and policies, and then just give you a quick snapshot to show you what the relationship is 
between some of these laws and policies and practices at the elementary school level. We're going to eventually have it at the secondary school level as well, but for today's presentation, I had time for elementary only. Next slide, thank you. Bridging the Gap is a collaborative effort. We've been in existence since about 1997. We're funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, and our goal really is to look at the impact of policies, programs, and other environmental factors on the health behaviors of children and adolescents, particularly those um, in high-risk racial, and ethnic, and lower-income populations and communities. We are a collaborative partnership between the University of Michigan's Institute for Social Research. Dr. Lloyd Johnston and colleagues lead that effort up. Um, as well as the University of Illinois at Chicago's Health Policy Center with Branch Lutka as the PI at UIC. Um, as I mentioned, we began in 1997, initially with a focus on alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs. And more recently, since about 2003, we are increasingly focused on youth diet activity and obesity and weight outcomes. Um, with our secondary school data, we're able to leverage um, secondary school level outcomes at the um, adolescent level. But for today, I'm not going to focus on that. Next slide. As part of bridging the gap, um, some of the things that we do are look at um, uh, state laws and district policies related to all aspects of school wellness. So it would include anything related to nutrition education, school meals, competitive foods and beverages, including fundraising, physical activity, physical education, and implementation and evaluation. So for today's presentation, I'm going to um, go through with you our most recent data from school year 2010 to 11 to tell you a little bit about the extent to which state laws are already addressed by fundraisers as part of their competitive food law. And then I will also follow on with data about um, district policies in this area. Next slide, please. So um, many of you may be aware that well over about 35 or 36 states have um, competitive food laws. But the reality is only a fraction of them actually address fundraiser as part of their competitive food provisions. And as you can see with this slide, there are 17 states at the elementary and middle school level that mention fundraisers as part of their competitive food law. And there are only 15 states that do so for the high school level. Next slide. What's particularly telling about these state laws, remember when your N is only 17 to begin with, <laughs> your y-axis is going to be pretty small. So here um, you can see that less than 14 states overall are addressing fat, sugar, calories, sodium, trans fats, and candy as part of their competitive or their fundraising restrictions um, in their competitive food law. And what you can see in particular, if you can point the arrow going downward on all the lines, <laughs> um, you can see that the provisions tend to be stronger at the elementary level than they are at the middle and high school level. Um, and that the most commonly addressed um, items or specific requirements for fundraising and food relate to restrictions on fat. Um, fat content and restrictions on sugar content. Once you start get to get down to calorie restrictions, sodium restrictions, trans fats, and candy in particular, you see very few states addressing these things with regard to in-school fundraisers. Now what I would like to note here on, on this slide before we go to the next one um, is this is an analysis of on-the-book laws. So these are codified state um, statutory laws that's enacted by the state legislatures as well as um, adopted regulations that have been promulgated by the State Board of Education or any other agency with authority in this area. It would not include any in-practice fundraising um, uh, policies that might be in place that have not been formally codified. So there might be a few additional states with fundraising restrictions in this area, but they certainly haven't um, gone to the level of putting them on the books. Next slide, please. When we get to beverages, the numbers are about the same. Um, as you can see from this slide, um, when they address competitive beverages um, being sold for in-school fundraisers, they're more likely to address soda. But again, we're only talking about 14 states at the elementary level, only 13 at the middle school level, and only 10 at the high school level that prohibit the sale of soda in in-school fundraisers. The next most commonly addressed beverage is our uh, item is limiting caffeine content. Um, which obviously is not restricting a beverage per se, it's just saying no caffeine. Um, but then from there, if you look at the red line, you can see that only nine states prohibit other SSDs outside of regular soda at the elementary level, only three at the middle school level, and only two at the high school level. So SSDs are a big issue um, uh, in these fundraisers. They're not being addressed at all um, if they have a fundraising policy to begin with. Um, and then finally, um, 
Uh, we have a couple of other data points here related to limiting on beverage serving size and calorie content, but I'll skip those for now. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so moving on to the district data, and I told you I was going to go through this really quick. I just wanted to give you a quick overview to show you how little policies are addressing in school fundraising restrictions on foods and beverages. At the district level, as I mentioned, um, or as they mentioned in the introductions, I've um, had the opportunity to lead the largest ongoing nationwide evaluation of school district wellness policies. Um, so the data that I want to present right now is from our latest year of data from school year 2010 to 11. Um, that we represent 652 districts nationwide. Um, and the data that I'm about to present will have been weighted to show you what the proportion of districts are nationwide that have uh, fundraising restrictions in their wellness and related competitive food policies. Next slide. So as you can see here, 63% of districts nationwide do mention fundraising in their wellness or competitive food policies. There's no distinction in terms of mentioning fundraisers for elementary, middle, or high school. But for any of you who have seen any of my data or presentations in prior years know, just having something in their wellness or related policy related to fundraisers really doesn't mean a whole lot, because you'll see in a second next slide. These policies are really weak overall. So as you can see from this first slide, Less than 35% or less than one-third of all districts nationwide have specific and required limits on the sale of foods sold through fun, um, in-school fundraisers. And when I'm talking about limits here, I'm talking about restrictions on the percentage of fat content, on uh, grams of sugar, on sodium content, calories, candy, and trans fats. Again, just like what I did with the state law data, same pattern we're seeing here with the um, district policy data. So basically, the story here is less than one-third of all districts nationwide are addressing restrictions on food items sold for in-school fundraisers. Again, the most commonly addressed nutrients are related to fats and sugars, um, followed by restrictions on candy. Um, about one-fifth of all districts has some type of restriction on candy being sold through fundraisers. Um, very few are limiting calories. Um, sodium and trans fats are pretty much ignored um, in any policies addressing fundraisers. Next slide. And I'm going to um, answer a question that has been posted here. I apologize for not clarifying before. Um, on this slide, uh, soda is regular um, sugar sweetened soda. SSB is sugar sweetened beverages. So it would be anything other than soda. So it would include um, less than 100% juice. It would include um, sweetened teas, um, sports drinks, isotonic beverages, energy drinks that contain added um, sugars. Um, so here, again, you can see less than one-third of all districts nationwide are addressing beverages um, in their fundraising policies. When they do, they tend to focus primarily on restricting regular sugar sweetened soda. Um, and after that, it's really just limiting caffeine content. Um, a minimal number of districts, um, only 5% at the middle and high school level, are prohibiting other sugar sweetened beverages. About 23% at the elementary level are prohibiting other sweet, sugar sweetened beverages. And um, restrictions on 2% in whole milk are also quite minimal, and 15% districts at the elementary level, and 5% or so at the middle and high school level. Next slide. Now I just want to quickly walk you through just to show you what the potential relationship is between having um, strong restrictions on in-school fundraisers and what we're seeing at the elementary school level. You see that the elementary school level data are based on a companion study that has led by my colleague, Dr. Lindsay Turner, um, where she's been examining the prevalence um, of in-school competitive food and beverage um, practices in elementary schools nationwide as part of her study of the food and fitness study, which has been going on also we're, um, in our seventh year of that study as well. So next slide, please. And these are schools that are located in the districts where we have the district policies for. So as you can see from this first slide, um, uh, a larger percentage of elementary schools have fundraising restrictions if they're in a district or a district down a state with a fundraising restriction in place. So um, the second bar from the left, there you can see the district only. So if you're in an elementary school that has a district policy in place, you're more likely than in an elementary school with no policy in place to have some type of fundraising restriction. Same thing happens with district and state um, combination. We see some relationship between state only, but it's not really different from having no policy at all. Next slide. 
<clears throat> when we look specifically at restrictions on prohibiting candy sales in elementary school and school fundraisers, um, and um, elementary bans on sale of foods of minimal nutritional value in fundraisers, which as you may know, foods of minimal nutritional value include carbonated beverages and certain types of candies. Um, we see here that having a district and a state law in place um, that specifically prohibits candy sales in school fundraisers does increase the proportion of elementary schools that prohibit FMNB sales during fundraisers as compared to um, having no policy whatsoever. Next slide. And then finally, um, similar relationship here we see with prohibiting soda in in-school fundraisers and elementary school banning soda in in-school fundraisers. Next slide. And then fi next slide. So that's just a very quick overview. I just wanted to basically illustrate for you how little states and districts are doing with regard to restricting competitive foods and beverages through in-school fundraising. So there's a tremendous amount of opportunity that still exists, obviously at the federal level, but as Margo indicated, it could take several years before any federal rule came into play. And hopefully that federal rule will address the in-school fundraiser. But if not, it shows you that we have a tremendous opportunity at the state and district levels to continue to expand and enhance state and district laws and policies to address this um, critical area of competitive food access. If you're interested in receiving more information about Bridging the Gap, I encourage you to go to our website, bridgingthegapresearch.org. Um, you can see here um, at the bottom of our homepage on the left-hand side, you can sign up for our email list. Would you go to the next slide, please? Um, we publish a number of my graphs, reports, research briefs, things like that. I've illustrated here um, a little uh, snap snapshots from some of our district wellness policy staff and one of our uh, school level my graphs. This is the secondary school my graph. We also have a number of um, uh, fact sheets or issue briefs um, posted. We have one here listed on the availability of competitive food and beverages in elementary schools. If you go to our website um, and sign up for an email list, you'll be notified of these products. You can also go under the Research tab and click on District Policies, Elementary School Survey, and Secondary School Survey to receive any other information about our products. Um, and I thank you for your time today. And um, feel free to contact me with any additional information. And I'll stay on to answer questions in the end as well. Thank you. And I'll introduce um, Carrie Dabney now, who's going to talk about some experiences in Texas and what they've done there. Thank you. Thanks so much. And thank you for including Texas PTA in today's discussion. I am the former Healthy Lifestyles Chair for Texas PTA. Um, and my replacement is a gal named Christine Yovanovic. She's a passionate school health champion and mother of three children um, in elementary, middle, and high school. Uh, one of the things I was asked to discuss in my presentation today is the importance of school health law and policy to healthy fundraising. Um, and in Texas, we have the Texas Public School Nutrition Policy, which means that by 2010, uh, we had removed sodas and all forms of candy from grades K through 12 until after the end of the school day, which potentially has had an enormous impact on healthy fundraising um, throughout the state of Texas. We also, in that policy, have competitive foods um, with grade-based restrictions. And again, it's um, elementary in particular, restricting uh, the types of fundraising that can be done. And then there's an exemption um, as part of the policy for campuses to designate three days a year for a holiday celebration or a school-wide carnival or something of, of that nature where they can have the FMNVs and, and candies and sodas during the school day. We also in Texas um, have passed a number of school health laws um, and policy that include school health advisory councils, coordinated school health programs, um, your local district wellness policy, and, and others that allow for um, increased parent involvement in the decision-making process uh, of what's going on in the schools and in the district. But that only works if the parents are aware of these different opportunities. And again, the law and policies support a healthier school environment, but only if they are properly implemented. Because awareness and implementation um, are critical to supporting healthy school environments, Texas PTA developed a healthy lifestyles program to address the following needs. And one of the big needs is to identify the key stakeholders uh, who benefit from healthier kids and who share common goals, and then to um, break down the silos between these stakeholders to support better communication and relationship building 
in a recognized, sustainable framework. And that framework that we've um, developed over the past several years um, is the Healthy Lifestyles Chair position for a campus PTA or a council PTA board. By establishing a Healthy Lifestyles Chair position on a PTA board, it automatically elevates the importance of healthy lifestyles. It also allows those elusive school health champions um, that we all know are out there to identify a place for their interests and their efforts. And it gives those individuals the authority to deal with all things um, healthy lifestyles related in a recognized, established framework that already exists on a school campus as the PTA um, and is sustainable so that once that person leaves, a replacement can come in and, and carry on. Texas PTA provides training and resources to our members um, for Healthy Lifestyles, and these include using established documents uh, to provide information and common language around healthy lifestyle issues so that no one needs to be a, a content expert. Um, we are providing them information on specific law and policies so that Healthy Lifestyles chairs know what is supposed to be happening in their schools and can be better prepared to discuss those needs. And we um, inform our, our Healthy Lifestyles chairs where to look for school district and campus-specific policies or programs and plans so that they can collaborate with others who are already working on school health issues. In addition, PTA has uh, fundraising guidelines that, quite honestly, if they were followed, would not allow for unhealthy fundraising. Um, PTAs are supposed to follow all the laws, including school policies which would be your local district wellness policy if it had um, fundraising restrictions. They're not to exploit or use children as fundraisers. Uh, fundraising activities should have educational value and promote community involvement. And they should serve um, as a good example. In Texas, we also have the University Interscholastic League Booster Club guidelines, uh, which suggest that fundraising proje pro projects should provide dollar value for items sold and should support the educational goals of the school. Um, on the right-hand side, I've got a candy sales example that uh, is one I was personally involved with years ago when I became a PTA officer. We told the school we would not be doing a candy sales fundraiser, but instead would do a donation-based campaign. And when we asked how much money we needed to raise, we were given the following breakout. Um, and if you take a look at it, it's the, the candy sales fundraiser did take in $17,000, but it had to pay the middleman $11,000. Um, and that only left 6000 for the school to use. So it was a really easy sell for the parents to understand that instead of needing $17,000, we only needed $6,000. And they quite honestly were thrilled. Some other ideas for healthy fundraisers, um, besides a direct donation campaign that we've seen schools do in Texas, we have um, a school that is the Healthy Huskies, and they did a fun run, um, which is a real popular thing to do. And by cutting out the middleman, um, they made even more money than before. And a description of that fundraiser um, is going to be included in some of the attachments, I believe, that will be sent uh, after this webinar. And it is that Pleasant Hill PTA Makes Fundraising History. It's a, it's a great read. Also, another um, healthy fundraiser um, is a kid art auction. With art uh, no longer available to many students, the fundraiser used an art project to raise funds. And, and kids loved doing the art tiles. Uh, the parents and students attended a gala art auction um, that was put on by the PTA in the school, and, and the parents did on their child's artwork. And this was a really successful fundraiser. And then another one um, for your, your Title I schools is identifying a need and then fulfilling that need with your fundraiser. And a PTA in one of our Title I schools recognized that parents could not afford professional photo packets um, that are kind of standard in schools. So instead, what they did is a few times a year, they would create seasonal backdrops and then take student and family photos with a digital camera. They'd send those photos off to one of the big box stores for reprints. And then they sold student and family photo packets um, for a reasonable price to their families. So that was, uh, again, you know, a well-needed um, and well-received fundraiser. So if you want to, is this not clicking through? Uh, if you want to learn more about what Texas PTA is doing, um, access some of our resources. You can go to uh, www.txpta.org click on Programs, and then click on Healthy Lifestyles. So now I'd like to turn the um, screen over to Casey Hines, and, and thank you all for being here. Hi, I'm Casey Hines. I'm a, a mother in Lexington, Kentucky. 
With a family history of diabetes, teaching my children healthy habits was not just a nice thing to do, but a must do. I saw family members with diabetes struggle to change their eating and exercise habits and realized it's better to instill good habits in children when they're young instead of waiting until a problem develops. I liken it to working with cement while it's wet instead of after it's set. I found it's important to network with others who are working to create healthier environments for children, so please add me to your email, Twitter, or Facebook contacts. This is a page from a typical school fundraising catalog. The ones on the bottom of the page look more like Play-Doh to me than nourishment. You'll find schools raising money from cookies, candy, pizza, and cheesecake. Even one of the well-known wrapping paper catalog companies included a funnel cake mix. Raising money at the expense of the health of our friends and family doesn't fit with the historical goal of PTA to promote the welfare of the children and youth in home, school, community, and place of worship. Can you click my slide forward, please? Thank you. We have shifted a great deal of responsibility onto children to deal with the barrage of empty calories they face by telling them to make the healthy choice. How often do they go places where there is nothing healthy for them to choose? The typical school concession stand offerings are chips and candy. We tell kids to snack on fruit but fail to provide any fruit for them to purchase. Here in Lexington, we are working to change that with a program called Better Bites. Next slide. One of the critical goals from the recent Institute of Medicine report for preventing obesity is making healthy food and beverage options available everywhere. That's the idea behind Better Bites, and our school concession stand sold out of fresh fruits and vegetables, including bananas, oranges, apples, clementines, and carrots. While fruits and vegetables may not have as high a profit margin as soda, we view this as a service to our families. Which concession stand would you like your own child to purchase their snack from? The one selling candy or the one selling fruits and vegetables? Next slide, please. One great alternative to kids selling cookies and candy is a school jogathon. Children are given a pledge form to get family and friends to sponsor them on a per lap or flat donation. On the day of the event, they run, jog, or walk for 15 minutes. This is a great opportunity for parental involvement as parents mark laps and cheer on the students. The data from the laps completed can be used for creating math activities that create a personal connection to the student. It can also improve student achievement because physical activity affects cognitive functioning. This year, Cassidy Elementary held its sixth Dogathon and raised over $4,000 that went to supporting health initiatives. We bought soccer goals, yoga balls for the classrooms, plants for the school garden, picnic benches, and fruit for snacks. This year at Ashland Elementary, we had our first school-wide Dogathon, which raised over $1,600 for the arts program. Based on positive feedback from students, parents, teachers, and administrators, we expect this to be a yearly event that will grow over time. Five K races are also great fundraisers, but it can be daunting to put one together, especially for small schools or PTAs that don't have many volunteers. That's why in Fayette County, our district PTA organized a community-wide 5K that every school could use as a fundraiser. On the entry form, each runner designated which school to support and the proceeds were divided up among the schools based on number of entrants. This gives each school an incentive to promote the event with their families and neighbors. We encouraged all abilities and ages to participate, including walkers and a one-mile fun run, and had 749 participants our first year. Sponsors covered race costs, and we raised over $10,000 for school programming. 35 PTAs participated and committed to starting a healthy lifestyles committee at their school to promote wellness activities throughout the year. This year we expect to triple our participation and are starting couch to 5K programs 
and a kids marathon program. That's where the kids run 23 miles and then get a, over a course of a few weeks, and then get a, a certificate recognizing that they ran the 23 miles. We will also have, sorry, 26 miles. We will also have scholarship opportunities for children who can't afford the entry fees. I hope these healthy fundraising ideas have inspired you to consider alternatives to typical cookie and candy fundraisers. And now I'll hand it back to Molly for question and answer. Thank you, Casey, and thank you to all the panelists. That was a lot of great information. Um, we have a lot of good questions, so I'm going to try to pop around um, to them. The first one that was asked, uh, do the laws concerning foods during the school day include the many unhealthy foods sold at football, basketball, et cetera, games to students and parents? Margo, do you want to answer that? Yeah, so I can answer for the national law. Um, the, the new requirement for updating the school nutrition standards for all foods sold outside of meals will apply to foods that are sold, not foods given away like snacks and parties. And it applies to foods sold during the school day. So it'll apply, you know, they'll have to define exactly what school day is, like 30 minutes before, 30 minutes after. So concessions at ball games, at theater productions, and things that are clearly after school those won't be covered by the national law. Um, state and local policies, I think, address this differently. Um, we'd like to see more covering concessions, but I think that's very uncommon at this point. Yeah, Margo, this is Jamie. Um, it is pretty uncommon. Most of the state laws and district policies are specific to in school um, during the school day. Um, and they tend to be silent on whether they would apply um, after hours or at evening or community events. And this is Casey Hines. Um, that is one of the reasons that we started the Better Bites program and appeal to um, the sense of supporting our children and our families and recognizing that if we are telling them to make the healthy choice that we do have to provide healthier options. So um, that's one way to address that is um, bringing it up with the, the folks in charge of the concessions and, and asking where the health, you know, where the healthy food is that children can buy. And this is Carrie Dabney. Um, the Texas Public School Nutrition Policy is only good to the end of the, the school day as well. And I'm, you know, just, just looking at how hard it is to implement during the school day, I really look at, as Casey said, it's up to the parents um, and community members and, and school leaders to determine what's going to happen after school. And you can put a lot of um, pressure to bear um, on you know what's being served and sold after school, and and you know in the case of, of what we've been doing in Texas, we're trying to get them to provide healthy um, alternatives, not do away with what they're selling already because it's kind of traditional to you know eat a hot dog or whatever and drink a soda at a, at a football game, but to add healthy um, alternatives that, that people can choose. Thank you. Um, the next question, I think this is directed to Jamie. Um, I am curious if any policies outright ban food for fundraisers. Yes, there are some um, districts in particular that um, don't allow food for fundraisers. I should note that in the data that I presented today, that would include cases that um, completely ban the use of food for fundraisers as well as ones that have very specific and required restrictions on what can be sold through fundraisers. Um, if you're interested in the data on uh, districts um, that ban um, uh, food for fundraisers, I can uh, get you that data afterwards. So just send me an email, um, and CSBI can provide you with that if you didn't get it earlier. Great, thank you. Um, another question that came up is whether the USDA um, regulations and guidelines will be mandated. So the, um, the new USDA standards will be requirements that all schools that participate in the school lunch and breakfast programs will have to comply with. So they will be requirements, not suggestions. Thanks, Margo. Um, another question, uh, what do you think about no fundraising, just asking families for a $20 or so donation? Anybody want to? Yeah, this is Mark. Oh. 
So this Casey Hines, we've done that in Kentucky, and I think a lot of families appreciated it. We called it a no-hassle fundraiser, and we also gave letters um, so that they could, especially for PTA fundraisers, because it's going to a nonprofit that they could um, use for their tax returns, and um, a lot of families appreciated appreciated being able to do that. And this is Carrie, um, Tiffany, and, and parents love that option. So, you know, having some kind of a direct donation campaign um, works really, really well at, at all levels of, of socioeconomic um, schools. Yeah, we've had very good luck with it. This is Margot. Um, we've seen a lot of schools doing that around the country, and I know um, in my daughter's school, we've had um, very good luck with it. In many schools, it's one of their primary fundraisers. And I think the key thing is just to figure out what level of donation to ask for. You know, and depending on the socioeconomic background of the school, um, you know, coming up with the right level. At my daughter's elementary school, which is in Upper Northwest DC, a lot of parents are so grateful to just be able to send their kids to public school and not have to pay for private school that they actually ask for quite a large donation and and then they, you know, scale it back and, you know, ask families to give whatever they can, but their initial ask was pretty high and it um, raised quite a bit of money. Kind of along those lines, um, several questions have come in, uh, specifically directed towards Gary and Texas PTA. Um, how did you overcome objections about the fact that um, whether a misconception perhaps that unhealthy options sell better um, and how did you address that in a way that um, allowed you to move forward with healthier options? Um, well uh, first off the, the, the lots of parents understand um, basically the, what's going on with their kids nutrition and, and childhood obesity so it's it's not a real hard sell um, to the parents it, it was a harder sell um, earlier on to the principals and the, and the teachers because they are very dependent upon, um, you know, the discretionary income that comes from these and they didn't want to lose a penny of it and rightfully so. So you really had two target audiences that you were talking to. Um, both of them, you know, you, you discussed the health implications and, and improved academic outcomes for healthy kids and parents could buy into that pretty quickly. Um, and then you would work with both groups to try to come up with fundraisers that replaced the money, um, but did it in a healthy fashion. And quite honestly, the, the, the you know, preconceived um, ideas, if you've got good information um, and you can articulate them well, pretty quickly people just fall in line. So it's, it's an issue when, when you're not there to be able to explain it appropriately, but if you've got somebody who can explain it, it, it seems to work well. And this is Casey Hines. I would also um, recommend that if you do bring it up, um, be prepared to back it up with data um, instead of it just being your personal opinion. If you can back it up with data about why this is best for our children, you'll make a lot more progress than just um, putting it as your opinion that this is better. And there's a lot of data out there, especially with tying it into achievement. Great, thank you. Um, we have a lot of questions, and I just wanted to note there are a lot of PTA-specific questions, so if anybody is on the line and has um, specific PTA questions because we're not going to be able to get to them, um, please feel free to email me and um, we'll direct you to the information that you need. So my email address will be on the webinar, but it's M Simali Van Lu B-A-N-L-I-E-U at PTA.org. Um, since we are running out of time, I think that we'll wrap it up there. Um, but there were a lot of additional questions that we weren't able to get to, so please feel free. Um, the webinar will have the contact information for everyone. Uh, please feel free to follow up uh, so we can answer those questions for you. And we really appreciate everybody participating today, um, and we hope we started a really great conversation. So thank you all.